From the Flintstones to the Simpsons and Rick and Morty, a good cartoon always has a, well, written joke. But it feels like a good visual gag has become a rarity these days. That is why today I want to talk about a show that has nothing but creative visual gags through and through. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the OG masters of visual gags, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, and their magnum opus to comedy, Tom and Jerry. The show had a simple concept with a flawless execution. They took a simple game of cat and mouse and turned it into one of animation's most popular series thanks to their brilliant comedic timing, imaginative creativity, and phenomenal music and sound effects done by Scott Bradley. I mean, can you name a more iconic duo? Now before we go any further, let's talk about the duo that made it all possible. In the late 1930s, both William Hanna and Joseph Barbera worked in the same Rudolph Ising unit at MGM. They were actually matched out of desperation due to the failed cartoon series based on the Captain and the Kids comic strip. We were sitting there in a room, he ended up in a room with me as storyman, with nothing, to, no stories to do. So they thought, why not make our own cartoons instead? Barbera acted as the story man and Hanna as a director. In their first brainstorming session, Barbera suggested a cat and mouse cartoon titled Puss Gets the Boot. However, fellow co-workers complained that the idea wasn't very original. Even William Hanna was skeptical since the idea of cat and mouse was done to death by the late 1930s. But despite this skepticism, the short was completed in late 1939 and released to theaters on February 10, 1940 as Puss Gets the Boot. The short introduced us to the characters we would grow to love, Jinx and Jasper. Now funny enough, the beauty of this short is its simple and instantly familiar idea. Jasper is a cat, and as you'd probably guess he acts as the series' antagonist. And Jinx, who is much smaller in comparison and uses his wits to stay alive, is obviously our protagonist mouse. And there is our familiar idea. Without a single line of dialogue, we know exactly what the conflict is, who is the hero, and who is the villain from the very first frame. But this isn't what made the short famous. The genius was in the execution that followed. A series of slapstick gags inspired by earlier black and white movies that established the careers of legendary comedians like Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy, and the man who needs no introduction, Charlie Chaplin. First of all, I'm a big fan of Chaplin. Everything I saw of him, more than anything, was no voice. And a lot of it, and we were raised in that era, I'm not speaking. And also, I found out that with a cat and mouse, you really didn't have to speak. But that was Chase all the time. Gags and Chase. But Jinx and Jasper had a major advantage over all of those greats. These animated fellows could do things of which none of those talents were able. Jinx and Jasper can exaggerate any hit, slap, or punch to a whole new level. Furthermore, the short gave the future series its first nomination for Best Animated Short. Which it didn't win. But it grabbed the attention of Fred Quimby who ran the MGM Animation Studio and commissioned the duo to work on a series featuring the cat and mouse. But a few changes had to be made. For starters, the name. Hannah and Barbera held an intra-studio contest to give the pair a new name by drawing suggested names out of a hat. The prize of $50 went to the animator John Carr with his suggestion of Tom and Jerry, at the time best known as a popular cocktail with brandy and rum. Which, in my opinion, are the real star duo in this story. Am I, t am I right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Let's get back to it. Secondly, the design of the characters had to be changed. In the original short, Tom looked and sounded a lot more like a real cat. They anthropomorphized Tom by making him walk on his two hind feet and made him sound and act less like an actual cat. Jerry's design, on the other hand, remained mostly the same. And with these changes in mind, the Tom and Jerry series went into production in 1941. Barbera created the story of each short while Hannah supervised production. Hannah also provided most of the squeaks, gasps, and other vocal effects of the pair, including the most famous sound effects from the series like Tom's scream and Jerry's nervous gulp. By the mid-1940s, the series had developed a quicker, more energetic, and violent tone due to the inspiration from the work of their colleagues in the studio, Tex Avery, who joined the studio in 1942. 
The shorts became synonymous with violent humor, showing Tom using everything from traps, poison, hammers, axes, firearms, and even firecrackers to kill Jerry. But arguably, Jerry is the more violent one of the two since Jerry actually succeeds in his plans, like shutting Tom's head and fingers in windows and doors, uh, stuffing Tom's tail in a waffle iron, electrocuting him, slicing him in half, decapitating him. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But despite the frequent violence, there is no blood or gore in any scene. This kind of dynamic makes the violence a lot quirkier, and while it still looks painful, nobody really gets hurt. Now, like many animated cartoons from the 1930s to the early 1950s, Tom and Jerry was no exception to using racial stereotypes as comedy. For example, after an explosion, characters' blasted faces would resemble offensive minstrels with large lips and bow-tied hair. But the most controversial element of the show is the character with an exaggerated southern accent, Mammy Two-Shoes, the housemaid who often has to deal with the mayhem generated by the lead characters. The character was voiced by Lillian Randolph, and her face was never seen except for the very brief scene in Saturday Evening Puss. She was actually redubbed by Turner in the mid-1990s to make the character sound less stereotypical. Joseph Barbera, who was responsible for these gags, claimed that the racial gags in Tom and Jerry did not reflect his racial opinion. He said they were simply a reflection of 1950s society and were meant to be humorous. In Tom and Jerry's Spotlight Collection DVD, a disclaimer by Whoopi Goldberg warns viewers about the potentially offensive material in the cartoons. Now, some of the cartoons here reflect prejudices that were common in American society, especially when it came to racial and ethnic groups. Now, these prejudices were wrong then, and they are certainly wrong today. Removing Mammy Two-Shoes from this collection would be the same as pretending that she never existed. Nonetheless, Tom and Jerry was and still is an incredibly iconic and popular series. But it wasn't immune to the struggling with the invention of television that made the days of short films and cinema numbered. So, once MGM realized that their re-releases of older cartoons brought in just as much money as the new cartoons, the studio executives decided to close the animation studio, thus concluding Tom and Jerry's original run with 114 shorts from 1940 to 1958 and winning seven Academy Awards for animated short film in the process. Hannah and Barbera went on to establish their own television animation studio, Hanna-Barbera Productions, and produced hit TV shows such as The Flintstones, Yogi Bear, The Jetsons, and Scooby-Doo. The Tom and Jerry cartoons were given to Gene Ditch, who infamously had troubles working on the show due to overseas animation and budgetary limits. Later, Chuck Jones tried to replicate the success of the series too, and while Chuck had better luck bringing Tom and Jerry to its previous glory, it was clear that the genius of the show lied with its creators. Therefore, in 1975, Hannah and Barbara got back the rights to Tom and Jerry and the Saturday morning episodes. In these series of seven minute shorts, Tom and Jerry were no longer enemies. Instead, they were friends who went on adventures together. But, Tom and Jerry didn't willingly become friends. Stringent rules prohibiting violence for children's television tied Hannah and Barbara's hands. Unfortunately, Hannah and Barbara failed to bring Tom and Jerry to relevance, and the characters were de-aged as it was the trend in the 1990s. Nowadays, the characters make appearances in their direct-to-video movies with shallow gimmicks, unoriginal references to pop culture, and recycled gags. Some of those films reused the exact same gags and visuals from the 1940s and 50s. So while we can't get more new Tom and Jerry, at least we can still enjoy over a hundred episodes that can inspire creators to make witty, clever, and most importantly, funny slapstick animated comedy that people of all ages can laugh at without using a single word. Well, folks, unlike Tom and Jerry, we here at Totally Awesome Geeks want to get some conversations going. I mean, did you watch Tom and Jerry back in the day? Is there a place for Tom and Jerry on screens in this day and age? Or hell, what would you have named the duo after Jasper and Jinx? Let us know down in the comments. Be sure to subscribe. And if you haven't already, check out all the links in the description. And in the words of Tom and Jerry, 